Proteins are expressed from our genetic blueprint to perform specific functions in the cell. And even a small difference in protein concentration can lead to defect and disease. When we perform protein experiments that try to replicate the conditions inside living cells within a test tube, we need to know exactly how much protein is present under different conditions. Hello, my name is Jack Wang and I'm a microbiologist and science educator based in Australia. Today we will build on our previous discussions on protein analysis, talk more broadly about how we can measure protein concentration in any molecular biology experiment. You can find our previous videos on SDS page and Western blotting in the description below. And that is where we will start. STS page can be used to separate all the proteins in a sample by size. We denature or unravel the protein into a linear string of amino acids, apply an electrical charge across them, and separate the proteins into different sized bands. After this, we can stain the protein bands using Kamasi staining or transfer the bands onto a membrane and use specific antibodies to detect specific proteins via Western blotting. If we're going to compare the lanes to each other, we need to make sure that the amount of total protein loaded from each sample is the same. Otherwise, it's not an apples to apples comparison across the different lanes. All of the techniques we will talk about in this video are used to measure protein concentration before running your STS page experiment. One of the quickest ways of measuring protein concentration is to measure its resorbance at the 280 nanometer wavelength on a spectrophotometer. The assumption here is that there is a constant proportion of amino acids in all proteins with a specific chemical property, aromatic rings that will lead to an absorbance peak at 280 nanometers. And therefore this can be used as a proxy to calculate protein concentration. The formula is very simple. Absorbance at 280 nanometers equals to protein concentration in milligrams per milliliter. As long as you normalize the spectrophotometer by measuring a blank sample containing the same buffer the protein sample is diluted in, you can get a snapshot of protein concentration without adding anything else to the sample. You still need quite a large volume to fill a cuvette though, and you might not have enough sample to spare. The same measurement can be done using a nanodrop, a specialized spectrophotometer that can measure absorbance values with only one microliter of fluid. The same principle applies. Normalize the nanodrop using a blank, then repeat the measurement of absorbance at 280 nanometers for your unknown sample to get your protein concentration. This will sound super quick and easy, so what's the catch? Absorbance at 280 nanometers can be influenced by differences in protein structure. So if your sample contains different types of protein, it's not on a level playing field across the different samples in the different lanes. What we actually need is a set of protein samples with known protein concentrations and run them through the same experiment as our unknown sample. The best example of this is the Bradford assay, where we can use samples with known protein concentrations to convert the assay readout into real concentration values. The resulting standard curve can be used to interpolate any readings from unknown samples and predict their protein concentration. We can dilute bovine serum album, BSA, in sodium chloride to create our protein samples of known concentrations. We'll need 50 microliters of each sample at 0, 250, 500, 750, and 1500 micrograms per milliliter BSA. The starting or stock concentration of BSA tends to be 2 milligrams per milliliter in the kit. I'll give you a moment to work out the volume of stock BSA you need to add to each sample using C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2. Pause the video here to do your own calculations or just skip ahead to see the answers. Once we have all of the standard samples prepared, we can now add the Bradford reagent to them, as well as to our samples with unknown protein concentrations. The Kamasi dye is a component of the Bradford reagent, so this works in a similar way to the Kamasi staining technique we've already talked about. The more protein is present, the more dye will bind to the sample, and the darker its color will be. Usually this takes no more than 10 minutes at room temperature for a color change to appear. At this point, we've set up all of the reactions in Eppendorf tubes, and to measure the color change, we'll need to transfer the liquid to a cuvette and collect the reading using a spectrophotometer. For this assay, we can measure the color change at around 595 nanometers and repeat this for each sample with known protein concentration. When you plot this out for all of the known samples, a standard curve is created that can convert absorbance values of the color change into protein concentration. You can of course work with smaller volumes of the same samples on a 96 or plate, and use a plate reader to obtain all the readings in one go. 
Once we have measured the total protein concentration in each of our samples, we can normalize how much of them we load onto each lane of our STS page protein gel. This means that if we see a difference in protein band patterns across the lanes, it will not be because we just added a lot more total protein in one of the lanes as compared to the other one. The intensity of the banding pattern resulting from Kumasi staining or Western blotting can then be more reliably used to assess differences in protein levels across different biological conditions. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.